All right, now back on Tennis Channel Inside In. Always a pleasure. Uh, Monica Pleegs here doing another long run at Tennis Channel. Uh, officially, like, in your post-retirement glow up now, you've got a lot going on. You've fully gotten comfortable with a lot of different things. But welcome, first of all, back on the show. It's always fun to have you. Yeah, I was wondering when I was <laughs> going to get back in here because I already missed it. You know, I, I really like the show. I really like hearing everything that all the guests have to say. So I'm glad to be back for a second time. Okay, yeah. Well, you're, you're a recurring guest now. Officially, we'll have the jacket or t-shirt in the mail. Um, you're hard to track down in that regard. But you know, I mentioned it too, like you're in your post-tennis playing career now, that transition that everybody talks about being challenging. I don't know if there's like a great system for it, but you seem like you're nailing it because you're staying busy. You've got your feet into the tennis ground, but staying active and staying kind of as a post-tennis player, it seems like you've kind of gotten the hang of it so far. I mean, getting the hang of it is kind of like, yeah, I mean, yes and no. It's it's still really hard um, sometimes, especially when I come here and I work these long stints in the bigger tournaments. You know, I wish I was still playing. There's a part of me, I watch my highlights. I, I <laughs> you know, I relive the glory days and I wish that there was a part of me that could still be competing mm -hmm. at the highest level. But I'm kind of grateful that, um, you know, I was able to kind of find um, – a way in a, a new door into broadcasting, which is something that I was really passionate about when I played and yeah. even before then. And then, yeah, the, <laughs> the other insanity, the other insanity of my life, which is endurance sports. Well, that, I mean, when, when a doctor tells you you can't do your competitive sport anymore um, mm -hmm. at the same level, I still had so much uh, drive and fire in me. So I had to kind of redirect that somewhere else. <laughs> yeah I want to I want to get to that in a second you mentioned um other you know coming to terms with the end of your tennis career don't have as many photos as last time but I wanted to get to the exhibition that you had because uh, one of the guys one of my good friends here Nico Pereira was instrumental in that we talked about it and he talked about this event and how cool it was one for you to have this moment but then he just gushed about how Venus was a rock star and just perfect for the <laughs> event too killed it especially <laughs> like in all of the you know promotional things that we had to do all of the interviews it was really cool you know she wanted to know more about Puerto Rico I heard she has a place down there now <laughs> you know she oh. really she really embraced everything that Puerto Rico was she <laughs> loved the energy she brought two of her sisters out there as well and I hope they had a good time because it looked like they were having a great time <laughs> and uh, I mean we really wanted this event to be so much more than just a tennis match if not just yeah. like a uh, an opportunity for the people of Puerto Rico who haven't really seen me play too often to kind of do that in in this incredible venue. And Venus was just such a rock star yeah. um, from day one when she got there. And, and the match was a tremendous success. And I mean, um, you know, I, I had always idolized Venus, played against her a couple of times, but she really is a class act mm -hmm. of a person. Did it feel like you were putting a bow on your tennis career? I know it wasn't an official tour match, but it was a way to go out on your home soil with a crowd that was, and we could talk about the Latin American crowd and how passionate they are, but it did feel like closure in a way. It did. It, it felt great. Um, obviously, it was a very emotional night for me from the very beginning. Um, walking out onto the court, um, everything that kind of happened, seeing appreciation from the crowd was, was great for both of us being there. But, um, yeah, I... I'm still not ready to kind of like okay. say goodbye to okay. that former life. Um, I'm still doing exhibitions and all yeah. and all of that stuff, which is really cool. But yeah, in, in a way, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to once again play in front of um, my hometown, my home country, my my people. It was yeah. you know, incredible. What is it about that crowd? or sports specifically, because we do this every time there's an <laughs> exhibition or an event there and everybody's like, wow, Latin America, Puerto Rico. I mean, even in the areas of Colombia, it's like, wow, this crowd is amazing. Why, in your opinion, is that? I mean, the Latin American <laughs> crowds are something else. Yeah. We definitely um, ha bring a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I think it's just the Latin... Um, uh, that Maybe Latin flavor. Fire, yeah. that flavor, yeah. the yeah. blood coursing through our veins it's just mm -hmm. very passionate especially yeah. um you know in sports i mean we see it in soccer we see it in tennis mm -hmm. we see it in so many different sports that you know start to thrive and people want to get behind that also i feel like sport has the ability to impact lives it has the ability to 
um, you know, turn negative situations into a positive right. thing when there's positive news going on. Um, you know, I, I definitely saw that with the Olympics. I saw like a big shift that mm-hmm. all of a sudden people were like starting to forget about all the, you know, tough times that were going on and, and for sure boost their boost morale. Pretty yeah. Much. Yeah. It just, uh, it is good to see, especially tennis. Cause we're on the same page. A lot of people would like to see more Latin American tennis events, exhibitions is a start, but it would be nice if there was more meaningful tournaments as a way to grow the game, but also grow the players that could use that boost for their development. Yeah, I always feel really jealous, especially when I saw that the men's have um, a lot of tournaments in South America and Central mm-hmm. America um, leading up to Indian Wells. Um, I would have definitely loved to play in Argentina. I would have loved to play more in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Um, it, great places, obviously, you know, a Big push on the red clay, but it's also an opportunity for younger generations of Latin American players to yeah. have the opportunity to play in their home countries, which yeah. they don't really get a lot of. And we see a lot of Argentines coming through in their home tournaments, a lot yeah. of Brazilians in Rio, and it's like, yeah. that's fun. Yeah, for sure. And one of the people that we were discussing this with was talking about the Italian tennis movement. It's great. You have Sinner, you have the women that are going up, Paolini, all these players are doing well what's the reason was what I asked. And they said, there are so many challengers and local tournaments there. So you can start building those points, building that confidence mm-hmm. home. It's huge. And, uh, you know, even into now into Miami, I know it's not home, but you really see the Latin American flavor in this tournament. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause Miami has taken a big, big shift. It's no longer, you know, it's no longer just like a Cuban town or, you know, just Puerto Ricans or Dominicans. It's literally yeah. like all of South America, all of the Caribbean has kind of just, overflowed into Miami and it's it's home did you feel like that when you played it was like a big circle oh, of your a calendar thousand percent, <laughs> yeah. a thousand percent and yeah. you know whether um you know it, it's it's loud I get some players <laughs> might not be comfortable with it or whatever but at the end of the day I think it's like for both players you have to kind of focus because it does get you know noisy yeah. rowdy and stuff like that but I also felt very much um embraced yeah. by all sorts of Latin American fans, which was awesome. I know you saw the match Jari and Sebos Field. That match Brazil Chile. That oh, was that was that was, that was soccer level. That was insane. I mean, I think we were watching, um, you know, another outside court, and you can hear the sounds <laughs> yeah, coming from yeah. another one. That reminded me of Key Biscayne a lot too, because that would happen many, many times. But um, yeah, again, this is you know a huge Latin American following especially like in the Aventura area there's a mm-hmm. lot of South Americans a lot of Argentinians so it's it's really cool do you like the specifics of the switch i know there's definitely reasons for it but going to hard rock because there's conflicting viewpoints not that people dislike it but Key Biscayne was a pretty historic place, a lot of great memories there. By all accounts, this move was necessary and it will grow the game, but your thoughts, Monica, on kind of this move and where we are with this tournament now? I mean, I can see it from a tennis player's perspective, and then I can also see it from, you know, um, a tournament's growth perspective (laughs) as well as a spectator's perspective. Mm -hmm. I think Key Biscayne, everybody loves it. All the players loved it. It was a very intimate feel. I had grown up watching the Sony Ericsson, the Lipton and all of this stuff <laughs> yeah. that, you know, Miami open was known for over the years. And it was always where I wanted to play. Now, thankfully the last year that they had it there, I had really good results. So I was able to kind of <laughs> say goodbye on a yeah. good note. Um, but the tournament does need to grow. It did need to change, uh, especially when competing with Indian Wells and, and Rome and Madrid uh-huh. and all of these tournaments that have pretty impressive venues. Uh-huh. It needed, it needed to change. Um, when I step onto the venue of the Miami Open, you can see why they wanted to shift in that direction because they're able to fit in so many different fan experiences. They're able to fit in so many different food options, drink options, and really make it more about the fans Mm -hmm. and their experience. In turn, obviously, the the players, we have tons of courts to practice, which is great. Yeah, the the venue is a little bit more spread out and not as intimate as Cubis Gain, but you have to kind of think about it from the tournament's perspective Mm -hmm. and what they're up against yeah. with the rest of the tour. Indian Wells sets a pretty high measuring stick too. So it's yeah, a tough that's, one with that's that. That's like the, the top of the top and everybody's <laughs> kind of playing catch up and, yeah. and, you know, with good reason, they're doing great things. Well, I also like about Miami and Indian Wells too, but in Miami, you'll get the stars coming out, especially the sporting stars. You obviously Jimmy Butler a lot, but Neymar was out there. There's a lot of entertainers and, and it's good to see that crossover appeal and make Miami a destination. Yeah, I think it's really great. You know, we do have that star-studded affair. Um, I think it's, it's you know, great for the fans in general also to see that, 
you know, sports people are coming together and supporting mm. each other in, in their different um, uh, passions. And, and, you know, a lot of people yeah. are becoming <laughs> tennis fans nowadays. Yeah. And it's no wonder because you have these <laughs> great athletes on the court just doing pretty ridiculous things, to be <laughs> honest. When I look at some of these matches and some of the hot shots and stuff, I'm like, what is going on? Like, what are they having for breakfast? <laughs> what? Yeah. Somebody's drinking the Kool-Aid because they are doing some pretty yeah. spectacular stuff. But I mean, it's mutual appreciation mm -hmm. of, um, you know, yeah. at athletes at their best. Yeah. Sinner had a ridiculous shot today. I was like, how is this even possible? But it is cool. It's always cool to see. I saw the Ben Shelton, Emma Navarro with the Miami Dolphins crossover. Mm -hmm. And it's just funny to see world-class athletes who hadn't played tennis before stick out. But um, no, it's great. I, I did want to get into you here, uh, Monica Puig on Tennis Channel Inside and the women's results to what we've seen so far. You know, this tournament being as big as it is also has been pretty unpredictable. And you saw it at the top down. You saw Iga and Coco both lose before the quarterfinals. For Iga Sviantec, it's still a successful run, obviously winning Indian Wells and getting to the fourth round. But it's it's a loss. It's a performance that she's not used to. Alexandrova really tried some things tactically in that match to attack Iga's serve. I was very impressed with her game plan. It's also a little odd to see Iga have a bad game, but we know those do happen. Yeah, it's it's kind of that thing that we've seen the unpredictability in the female game. We've seen different multiple winners over the past couple of years. I feel like Iga's been the most consistent. We've seen <laughs> consistency from Pagula. We've seen it from Coco <laughs> Golf. We've seen you know, uh, glimpses of, of tennis past, like when we had a super dominant Justine Anna, we had a super dominant Serena Williams. We had somebody who was always dominating. Iga's right there, you know. Mm -hmm. You can have a bad day. You can have a bad tournament. She never really looked to me very comfortable on these courts. Maybe, you know, the shift between Indian Wells to Miami, two completely it's different brutal. climates, That's right. yeah. <laughs> two completely different courts. It's it's a different scenario. Um you know, it, it happens mm -hmm. sometimes. Maybe fatigue might be an issue because at the end of the day, with all the winning comes tons of matches played. I imagine <laughs> tons of hours on the practice court, in yeah. the gym, all of that. We have to, you know, I, I lived that <laughs> life, so I know the ins and outs of it all. Mm -hmm. So uh, while she didn't win, while Coco didn't win, I think they can <laughs> kind of close the chapter on this um mini hardcore season yeah. at the beginning of the year and look forward to what the clay is because they both do really well yeah. on clay. So I'm looking forward to see that transition. But, you know, Miami is Miami. It's a it's another yeah. Masters 1000 event. It's another WTA 1000 event. And, you know, it, it's really, if you're sharp, you're going to win. Right. And Iga, I mean, she's going to the clay. <laughs> no worries there. I like, mean, like, here the, we go again. How many Roland Garros is already and she's still st I know like she's got three in the young. bank. She's got three in the bank, and I said that I think six is the all-time record. So we'll, we'll monitor I, that one. I think she can get there for sure. It is interesting because, and these courts do, you know, set up nicely for the big heavy hitters, of which there are plenty on the WTA. I didn't feel it that way, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I got hit off the court in Miami. <laughs> Yeah. But yes, absolutely. And and that's the type of players that have frustrated Iga. She can obviously beat them, but that is kind of the type of player that has given her trouble. Um, you no, know, there's been some unpredictability, but one of the feel good stories, funny to say it this way, but Danielle Collins and official unofficially her last dance. Yeah. That, we'll see if she walks that back. But she's looked better than ever incredible. this week. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. I, I had the opportunity to MC the tournament in Abu Dhabi yeah. and saw her come through the qualifying, had the chance to interview her after one of her wins. And she, this is like one of the first times that I've actually seen her approach an interview with a smile. And I asked her just that, like the retirement, what does it mean for you? What is going through your head? And she's pretty much just taking it as one day at a time. Everything here is a bonus. Um, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, she's playing and she can play some big hitting <laughs> tennis. She has incredible fire. She has a personality and a charisma on the court that you don't see from many players. It doesn't matter what's going on. She is just all Danielle all, all the time. I don't care what's going on on the other side of the net. I'm a do me. <laughs> I don't care. I'm here to yeah. do business. And sometimes that attitude <laughs> is exactly what you need to win matches because you can't really be preoccupied with so many things right. on the court. There was a story from a few years ago where I was in like a media room and the topic of just competitors and it wasn't even her name brought up. It was a San Diego Open where someone just said the word compete and she was literally stretching for her match and she peeks right and is like, I will compete with anyone. Oh my 
<laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, that's just, that's, you know. 100%. And it's great <laughs> yeah, to have yeah. that mindset because yeah. a lot of the time, people, tennis players, women, some of them are afraid to compete because we're afraid of the result and the mm -hmm. wins and losses. But at the end of the day, it's about how you compete yeah. on the court because you never know. You could be getting steamrolled yeah. and then you just keep at it. You keep finding a way around all of these little, you know, bouts of ups and downs right. in a match and you compete well, you can pull a hat trick. You can yeah. turn it around. I like how she tabbed Peyton Stearns to keep the loud commands going after <laughs> retirement too. I think it was just interesting too to see how she beat Caroline Garcia, who had just gone through, mm -hmm. you know, several of the game is very best, beating Osaka and Coco back to back. And Garcia, who I think it was Andrea Pekovic who had the line on commentary, like she's just gonna do Caroline Garcia things at all times. Yeah. Because it's still fun from my perspective to see her play tennis because no one plays tennis like that. Right. I mean, and Carolyn Garcia is another player who when she's on, she's on and she can mm -hmm. literally hit you off the court. She can serve you off the court. Um, and I honestly did think Danielle was going to win this match just because of how mm -hmm. she's been looking, how she's yeah. been playing. I like Danielle's face on the court. It's just there. She she looks like she's in the moment, present, just focus on what she needs to do, not really worried yeah. about if she misses a ball or not. That's not going to affect yeah. her game plan. It's like, okay, if it's not working, right. I will figure it out, and then we'll go from there. So, right. you know, <laughs> she's in another Miami Open semifinal. <laughs> I think the draw is, you know, favorable for anybody who's right. willing to take the opportunity. Huge opportunity. Yeah, it is a huge opportunity. Her semifinal still to be decided. We're waiting the result in one match as we record this. But the other side, it's Rabakina and Azarenka. Rabakina, it seems like this happens too, right? Every so often, she reminds us, look, I'm in the top class of the WTA because there's nobody that, and I'm stealing the line from Petchy and Arias again, that plays the match on her terms like her, right. watching the match against Sakri, and Sakri showed tremendous fight. But that serve is lethal and it is hard to read. And Lindsay Davenport did an unbelievable job explaining how when she's serving well, when she's in rhythm, you just can't get a read on it. Yeah, and what a lot of people also don't recognize about Rabakina is that because she's tall, most people think, oh, tall equals she doesn't move well. She moves pretty decently around the court and she can defend and she can turn defense into offense really well. Um, Azarenka, though, it, she's a bulldog. She's <laughs> like Danielle in that aspect that, they compete really well. It doesn't matter which way the match is going. Uh -huh. They're going to fight tooth and yeah. nail to turn it around. And I think that, you know, Azarenka <laughs> needs to really take it to Rybakina <laughs> because I think she can. I, I remember, I think it was one of the years or the year that Vika won the Sunshine Devil that I played 16, against yeah. her. And she, I, I started to find my way around the second set. And then she said in the press conference, I noticed that she stepped her game up, but my game plan was like, I'm not going to give Monica an inch of this baseline. I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to wait until mm -hmm. she drops her level. And that's the Vika that mm -hmm. won so many matches, won so many titles. Yeah. And Rybakina, again, she needs to serve well. She needs to be solid off of the ground. And, uh, you know, that's that's what it needs to yeah. be. If not, as her name, she's... <laughs> yeah tons of respect for what right. she has done and what she's continuing to do. I love that quote. She said, I'm, you know, I've been on tour for 20 years. She's 34, but I still feel like I'm improving. Oh yeah. And, and some of that's the game. I mean, you, you cope with what you've lost by adding things, but also the mentality. She had to deal with that Hawkeye outage for an hour. That was insane. An hour. I've never <laughs> seen anything like that. Obviously when I was playing, it was still the electronic line calling. I think it was like a beta test. That's, it was still not, not even there, yeah. but, um, yeah, in order to come back yeah. from something like that, it's not even a rain delay. You have to just kind of stay focused and ready because the yeah. minute that is fixed, you're right back Time on to go. the court. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, that's why that was huge. Rabakina, too. I mean, she she blew a lot of set points, match oh, yeah. points, rather, against Sakari. But to dig back into the third set when a lot of players, men and women, would have probably collapsed in that situation. Oh, yeah. So that'll be a big one. Uh, the other one we're still waiting on, Pagula and Alexandrova at this time are in the third set. So... Jesse Pagula is another one. Like, we were wondering. She shuffled some stuff up off court. She shuffled some stuff on court with her serve. Disappointing Indian Wells. But here she is in the quarters, if not more, with a golden opportunity to set her season up properly. Yeah, it's just like Sakri. Maybe they needed a fresh voice. They mm -hmm. needed a new perspective on things. Maybe their coaches aren't really telling them anything they don't already know. But since it's coming from a voice that's just not yeah. the same one all the time, it just hits and yeah. it clicks and she's finding it. 
And I give her a lot of respect because this is also a home tournament for her. She lives in Delray as well. So it's like, you know, taking the time to play at home is tough yeah. because, you know, you're you're also, how do you balance your, your home life when it's <laughs> technically still a tournament yeah, and you're yeah. going back home? You can't really turn it off. But she's done a great job, I think, you know, watching her match yesterday. She's served well. She she moves incredibly well. A lot of people don't think that she hits a really big ball because, you know, she just... It, it Numbers say like otherwise, she, though. She, exactly. Yeah. She she looks like she... And this is... <laughs> it's always been this way since juniors. I played against her in the juniors <laughs> as well. She looks like she has a very easy technique that she doesn't need to put a lot of effort into her strokes. But, man, that ball just smokes off the racket. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a... Yeah. tough to return and she's also very athletic she moves around the court well really makes you work for it mm -hmm. so yeah I, I like what i'm seeing from her right now i give her a lot of credit because she's done un unbelievable things she's you know pushing 30 now the time to make the move and it's an aggressive one because the next step is a grand slam success oh yeah so this is a big move but it's probably the thing she has to do hey Sometimes you have to do things that might scare you, might challenge you, but you never know the reward. And a lot of mm -hmm. people talk about the fact that, you know, she hasn't gotten past the quarters of a slam and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But she's gotten there. Mm -hmm. She's done some pretty remarkable things. I would like anybody yeah. <laughs> to try and do what she has done and, and you know, then, then talk uh. because, you know... She'll get there. I think she'll get there because, again, tennis is wide open. You yeah. have something happen like yeah. that happened this week, and she is just all in, focused on what she needs to do. Right. She's listening to her coaches, and, and they say something that just makes her full of confidence. <laughs> she can get it. Oh, for sure. And it, it's there. It's there. I think it's within her. The only other player I wanted to mention briefly was uh, Emma Navarro's rise has been one to watch. It's very rare to see a player – skyrocket up the rankings especially at this point in her career what have you seen from her game because obviously the results have come but this player that had been around the block had been not going through the motions but not having it all put together and then it just clicks and she's beating some of the very best players in the world i mean she moved up the rankings <laughs> in ninja mode because that was like nobody saw it coming and she just went about her business yeah. worked did the work, put in the hard yards, and all of a sudden she's exactly where she needs to be and the results speak for themselves. We're talking about consistency. She has shown consistency time and time again. I really, I love her forehand. I love how she hits the ball. I love that she's not afraid to come to the net. I love her attitude on the court. I think it's really, really good. If stuff is not working out or right. really going well, she's just, you know, there. She just keeps trying, keeps at it, doesn't really start whining mm -hmm. and complaining and all yeah. of this stuff. So. I mean, I really, really like what I'm seeing from Emma, and she's also one of those really young ones, but she's playing like a yeah. veteran because, you know, she, yeah. she just has it handled on the court, and I think that's great. You never want to confuse, you know, chillness, I'll say, for mm -hmm. weakness. Oh, yeah. There's tons of different personalities, you know, like not everyone's a rah-rah, mm -hmm. yelling, come on type. She's got more of a chill demeanor, but that's a competitor out there, and we're oh, seeing absolutely. it. absolutely. Well, this is a huge opportunity, and I'll close it on the Miami stuff with this. All, you know from experience, right? All it takes is one good result to get you could have you could be having a, a rough season, things not going your way, bad luck. You have one good result in a tournament like this, and suddenly you're on the right track. Yeah, and it, <laughs> it also sets up the rest of your season because if you're somebody who you know is is ranked 20 in the world, or you know you're struggling a little bit, or you have massive points to defend later on in the mm. year, you have a good result at the beginning of the year. It's not that you can relax, but you can kind of see everything else as mm -hmm. a push forward in the right direction. And also, confidence comes from winning tournaments, winning matches, mm -hmm. and all of that. So, <laughs> lots lots up for grabs in mm -hmm. the next couple of days. Yeah. The flip side is you're just chasing all year, and you never feel like you've got there, and you're pressing. Well, I can't wait to see how this shakes out. Miami Open, always one of the best tournaments. Uh, Monica Puig, this was fun. I do have one more thing to ask you about. I got to ask you about this 70 yeah. point 70 point three miles and official triathlete now and a yes. personal record, which I think the direct quote was, let me see if I have this right. Five hours and 42 minutes of hell. Five hours and 42 <laughs> minutes of hell. Yeah. It was, um, it, oh my God. So again, it's something that, that, um, I wasn't really let, ready to let go of my, um, competitive life. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm still extremely competitive, even if it's playing cards. I remember I was, <laughs> On vacation with my husband, we started playing like 
gin rummy and he started winning and I literally got the deck of cards and I flicked it all in his face. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. But, um, it's, it's the thing that it fuels my fire. It keeps me competitive. It, it makes me want to strive for something. And I think the biggest thing is Mm -hmm. it's a sport where I consistently see improvement in everything, whether it's the swimming that improves, the biking that improves, the running even improves. Mm -hmm. And it's not monotonous in the sense that I can do different workouts every day. Um, but I'm always moving forward and it's a sport that where an amateur can qualify for a world championship. An amateur can make huge strides in the sport without needing to turn pro because I don't want to be pro (laughs) at all. What these people who want to become pro are doing to get to that level. And the, the hours, the numbers they're pushing is, is remarkable. But I do really want to be very, very good. So I'm dedicating myself to to exploring what can I do to achieve my own level of excellence. I have a coach. I have a strategy. We talk about it a lot. And, um, you know, I have my own dreams in this sport and and things like that. So it's good to have something to push for. And that's what I really love about it. I think your example is a great one. Again, congrats on it. I think fourth in your age group, it's a tremendous accomplishment to, to do the work and see the result. But it doesn't just have to be for pro athletes. It yeah. could be for college athletes, for high school athletes, for anybody that had something cut short that you can find something else to do to dedicate yourself to. And to also, whether it's the athletic progress, just also feel like you're accomplishing something because a lot yeah. of people miss that. And unfortunately, you know, it, it all ends for all of us. Pro athletes get to do more of it, obviously, but you know, it's a good lesson for people out there that you can find something else, devote your energy to and still find joy in competition and bettering yourself. Yeah. And that was always something like a big asterisk, like how am I going to stay active um, after tennis? Because, you know, there was no way I'm just going to go to the <laughs> gym and do a, uh, you know, a couple reps. It's like, it gets boring. But yeah. um, another sport that I could find joy in, <laughs> Joy, I say joy. <laughs> Painful like, joy. Yeah. The, the joy comes there when you're yeah. crossing the finish yeah. line and all of a sudden you cross the finish line and you're like, I want to do another one. But while well, you're doing <laughs> Two it, hours like, in, you're like, I don't yeah, know about it's this. It's like, I don't want to do this anymore. You cross the finish line. Okay, where's the next one? Yeah. But um, it's just, you know, again, having something to work for. Mm-hmm. It gives me a purpose to wake up in the morning. gives me a purpose to look after my body, to take mm-hmm. care of myself because obviously I ended my career yeah. due to injury. I don't want any injuries to pop up anywhere else. So I, you know, it keeps me disciplined mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. And I get to do it with my husband, which is awesome. Um, he also, you know, keeps me honest. <laughs> we both hold, hold each other accountable so many times when we don't want to do stuff. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. remember we signed up for this and we're not going to go there to bonk a race. We're going to go there <laughs> yeah. to actually like, yeah. you know, put up some good numbers. So it's great. I'm enjoying myself. I think at this point in my life, I'm, I'm you know, I, I know who I am. I know yeah. what I want and, and nothing's going to stop me on that regard. I, I just want to keep pushing for more. So staying active is your number one thing. And, and I'm going to end with this. What type of exercise did you do this morning before the tennis channel ship? Today, I took the day off. Today, so off, okay. today wasn't the day to ask me. But, okay. <laughs> yeah. you know, yesterday whether, then? Whether it's going out for a run. I, yeah. I, yesterday, I went for a swim. It was the first okay. time I had swam after after yeah. the race. But I did a swim. I went to the gym afterward. Uh, tomorrow, I'm probably going to go and run 8 to 10 miles. <laughs> yeah, see, that's, that's I what I was getting I love to run. At. Uh, run yeah. Running for me is like an escape. It's, it's, it's something awesome. I can disconnect with. First. It's awesome. I just see 8 to 10 to 12 to 13. I'm like, I'll do 3 or 4, and I'm like, I feel so just inadequate. Just say it's an hour and a <laughs> half. Just yeah. put a podcast on. Yeah. Put your own podcast yeah. on. Listen to yourself talk and just, uh, you know, yeah. have some fun with it. But, um, yeah, running, running brings me joy, and that's pretty much where this whole journey began. Well, Monica Puig, it's awesome to have you on this show. Appreciate you coming here, doing the show, in addition to TC Live and, and everything that you do. And this is a really cool story. I think a lot of people take inspiration from the fact that you found something else. You're still competing out there. So uh, we'll have you on again soon. It won't be as long of a wait next time. I'll <laughs> good, hold to that. Good. But thanks again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much.